you get an earthquake where all the built up displacement is released. Um, and that might be associated with some surface uplift. And since there is an ocean on top, you then get a tsunami. And obviously this uh, causes a lot of problems um, and it poses a large uh, hazard. But as you can see with this little uh, animation here, the tectonic stress buildup and well, the development of a subduction zone in general has a very large time scale of millions of years and then the seismic cycle of hundreds of years. But the earthquake itself is on the order of minutes or seconds and the tsunami then occurs on hours. So many different things to take into account. And um, it's difficult to model these things because models usually don't like, numerical models don't really like too large contrasts. So if you have a lot of differences in time, it starts to break down. So what, what I mainly did during my PhD was developing a method that kind of uh, used different time scales. So we have a geodynamic seismic cycle model, abbreviated in the slides as an SC model, and a dynamic rupture model called the DR model. And um, well, I, I will briefly walk you through what they do. So the geodynamic seismic cycle model solves for the conservation of mass and conservation of momentum, as does the dynamic rupture model. And the geodynamic model also solves for the conservation of energy because then it can um, accurately model subduction um, history, geodynamically. The geodynamic model has a viscoelastoplastic rheology and the dynamic rupture model has an elastic rheology. And then the most important thing really is that this geodynamic model those for tectonic stress buildup and the evolution of a subduction zone, which takes place over millions of years, and also the seismic cycle at some point, which takes place over hundreds of years, whereas the dynamic rupture model is completely uh, suited for modeling dynamic earthquake ruptures, which take place on minutes and seconds. And then the idea is we take this geodynamic seismic cycle model and we take one particular event and we take the output of that event from this seismic cycle model and use it as input for the dynamic rupture model. And in that way, we can model one megathrust earthquake from geodynamics to seismic cycles to dynamic rupture timescales. So in order to do that, um, we start with our geodynamic model. And this is our initial setup. So we have an oceanic plate here, which we push towards the continental plate. We have a little weak zone here so that the subduction zone actually goes down. And then after a few million years, we have a suitable subduction geometry. And as input here, we have the slab age, this geometry, the velocity, and uh, viscoelastoplastic rock properties constrained by lab estimates. And then if we do that, we get an event at some point, a slip event. And then we need to couple that slip event to the dynamic rupture model. And we couple the following things the time step for which we extract everything from the geodynamical model, the rock properties, and here you can see uh, what the subduction geometry looks like after 4 million years, but at the beginning of the slip event. Then the stress field, because again, in order to get an earthquake, you need to know the stresses um, that kind of overcome the strength of the rock. Then the friction parameters, which represent the strength of the rock in this case. And the fault geometry, which I um, here have as the second invariant of the viscoplastic uh, strain rate. The problem is that in this geodynamic model, it's a continuum model. So there is no explicit discontinuity. So actually there are no faults, but we, uh, approximate a fault by looking at the localization of the strain rate uh, in so-called shear bands and then we um, smooth um, a line through that and that is then our megathrust earthquake, a megathrust fault. Then what we want to do uh, in this particular thing I'm going to show you is apply this, this modeling framework of these two models to splay faults. And if you're unsure about what splay faults are, this is a very uh, simple cartoon of a subduction zone. We have a subducting plate, an overriding plate, a little accretionary wedge, the mega thrust here in black, and splay folds are the folds that splay away from the mega thrust. 
So these are display faults. And people are typically interested in these display faults because as you can see, they are quite steep. They're much steeper than a megathrust. And the idea is here in a simplified manner again, megathrust display. Since it is so steep, if you have an earthquake that goes on the display fault instead of the megathrust, because it's steeper, you will get more vertical surface displacement. So your seafloor will uplift a bit more and this will then be a bigger uh, tsunami. So it's important to take these play faults into account. And that's what we're going to do. So I just told you how we got our megathrust fault. But as you could see, now I plot the viscoplastic string. There's a lot of stuff happening in the accretionary wedge here. It's, it's very dark, meaning there's high strain. Um, here zoomed in again a little bit. And what we do in order to get our splayful geometries from this is that um, we, we picked the most clear ones. Here it's translated again to accumulated slip. Um, and we pick these six splay folds um, and then connect those to the megathrust fold. And then we have our dynamic rupture model. So this is what it looks like. As input, we use um, everything from the geodynamic seismic cycle model. So the P wave velocity that is plotted here is all based on the variables that were used as um, that were used in the geodynamic model. And then we have our fault and uh, our splay faults here. And then what happens? Well, we can run the model and I have a little video for you here. Um, but I'll first walk you through what you're actually going to be seeing. So the faults are indicated here in dots and here as straight lines. And we have here the maximum slip rate on the fault. So if it's, if it's dark, it's a high slip rate. And here we have the horizontal velocity in the model. And here we have the vertical velocity in the model. And you should take note that uh, these are very uh, zoomed in versions of display faults, just so that we can see what happens on display faults. Um, so if I uh, start the video, you can see that it, it comes in. I didn't show the actual nucleation. Um, that happens a bit further down, which corresponds to what happens in the geodynamic model. But now you can see that the rupture uh, travels up dip on the megathrust. And then when it encounters the first display faults, it actually goes on that display fault. So it's pretty cool. We see that the display fault is immediately activated once the main rupture uh, passes it. And then as the, the rupture progresses, you can see that it does not activate the, the next display fault you encounter. So there is simply, it, it's not energetic enough. So we, we, can, we can continue this simulation and then if you look at what happens in the horizontal velocity field, for example, you see that a lot of these dark regions here, those are actually um, waves that have, well, first traveled up towards the surface and are now traveling away from the surface again. And you can see that they will travel towards this play fault here. And what happens then is that as soon as these waves that are reflection from the surface encounter our splayfold here, this splayfold is then activated from the top and then ruptures downwards. And then as the, the, the wave energy keeps accumulating in the shallow portion of the accretionary wedge, the shallower splayfolds are um, also activated once um, we have uh, enough energy there. So quite complicated, but Main thing is that during one earthquake, one earthquake simulation, what we see is that all six play faults can actually be activated simultaneously within a single rupture. So how does this then affect our surface displacements? Well, here you see the final surface, final vertical surface displacements for a model without play faults. And we can plot the results from the model I've just shown you on top. And this then looks like this. You can see very clear peaks, and these peaks correspond to the splay faults. So indeed, what we would expect um, actually happens. You have much larger vertical displacements um, at the location where you have a splay fault rupture. 
so this again is important for a tsunami uh, hazard. So then what I have shown you is that we can now model, we have a framework for modeling tsunamigenic earthquakes or earthquakes in a subduction zone in general um, over a large range of time scales from geodynamics to seismic cycles to dynamic ruptures. And there is spontaneous rupture nucleation and arrest in this dynamic rupture model. It all stems from the geodynamical model. And the rupture can then occur on multiple splay folds during a single event. And this leads to larger surface displacements and tsunami heights. And then just to kind of say why I'm in Leeds then, because this was my PhD work <laughs> in Leeds, I'm doing kinematic and dynamic modeling of subduction zones with an application to intermediate depth seismicity. So still subduction zones, different type of earthquake. And at the moment we're benchmarking uh, a simple uh, thermal subduction model. That's it. Excellent, thank you very much. So does anybody have any questions? If so, stick them in the chat. While you're writing, I'll, I'll ask you a quick one to start off, which is, in order for the splay fault to actually you know, have a rupture, how different can it be in terms of properties to the main interface? You know, the fact that these things exist, can you say something about you know, how strong or weak displays must be relative to the main underlying megathrust interface? I mean, in our case, display fault are all uh, much weaker than the megathrust because they're in the Kushner wedge, which is uh, the sediments and the, the megathrust at least in the deeper part is in the basalt, but then uh, the shallow part is also in the sediments, but as close to the basalt as possible. So they're, they're definitely um, much weaker. Exactly how much? Uh, well, I can look at what, what is in the model, but I, I wouldn't dare generalize at the moment. So we've got a question from Jess who asks, from an observational or modeling perspective, how do we know how common it is for splay faults to rupture top to bottom rather than bottom to top? So most dynamic rupture models that I have seen, it's always about the branching of the splay fault. So it's, uh, yeah, rupture is on the megathrust and then will it choose to go on the uh, splay or not? Um, so in that case, I'd say that what has been studied most is uh, bottom to top. Uh, from top to bottom, um, I don't know about any models that do that or have looked at that in detail. Uh, still need to look up the observational stuff, but uh, that is on my immediate to-do list. Okay, yeah, so that kind of feeds into the interest of time. I'm going to roll together the next three questions, which are basically saying what the observational sort of constraints on sort of how important these these play faults are in terms of the sort of the measured tsunamis and you know how many might be active at once and the, and the scan. I mean there's a there are a lot of uh, so-called tsunami earthquakes where you have a bigger tsunami than expected from the uh, surface wave moment of the earthquake so people typically tend to look for an alternative explanation and if, if no landslides are found then um, their next stop is usually a splay fault, especially if they can image one. Um, so there are instances of, of seeing splay faults and clear indications. They're not that many, but they, they are definitely there. Oh, thank you very much. So in the interest of time, we're going to move on. And next up, we've got Margarita from the BGS, who's going to be telling us about the interaction of slow slip and regular earthquakes. Over to you, Margarita. Uh, you're muted. Okay. How this looks like. Yes, yeah, great, thanks. Okay then, so I have changed slightly the title, um, including um, comp other complex physical patterns of stress interactions. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about interactions that involve earthquakes, their aftershocks, and slow slip events. Uh, the results that uh, I'm going to present come from uh, a commentary published recently in Seismological Research Letters and three also free to read um, articles, two in GRL and one in um, a recent volume of BSSA. In the interest of time, I will just continue. So here is um, a figure that I feel that most people in the field are um, familiar with. Uh, and this is um, a framework that has been used uh, the last decade or so for explaining aftershock triggering. Uh, you recognize uh, the red blue areas that correspond to areas following a main shock that um, are, are under stress load or under stress shadow, um, promoting or not the triggering of aftershocks. And the example I'm showing here uh, comes from the 7.2 El Mayor Kukapa back in 2010. Uh, and the aftershocks uh, you see in yellow represent the aftershocks uh, that occurred the first three years after El Mayor. Um, the focal mechanism represents the largest aftershock, the 5.7 Ocotillo event. Um, and one of the issues uh, that um, is a challenge the last decade uh, in stress modeling is that really the aftershocks are actually happen in ideal, hypothetical, optimal faults, or they do not even happen in one unique fault. So our oversimplification in using parallel faults to the main rupture uh, hinders our understanding of the physical process. So if we apply traditional techniques using the three years of aftershocks in 3D space over a dense grid and we summarize the results, uh, we see that only the 35% of triggered aftershock after El, El Mayor, a main shock, uh, actually can be explained by the optimal uh, fault implementation, which was first introduced from King et al. back to 1994. So the results in map view are presented in the figure here. And every earthquake that we could explain with the optimal faults um, are in blue, where the failures uh, of, are in um, white. Now, what I mean success or failure, uh, in the specific location, it means that um, we assume a hypothetical optimal fault, but then we check this theoretical plane solution, two, two nodal planes of theoretical, against what we actually observed as planes from focal mechanisms from first polarities focal mechanisms. So if we do this uh, quantitative testing, we only get the plane right 35%. Now in the left, sorry, in the right corner, uh, this is the total solution space of every possible fault. Uh, here is the sense of sleep expressed as rate. And here is something we call distance, which is a, it is an angular parameter combining the orientation and the dip of planes. So if we use King's approach, we only have these blue um, uh, dots here, boxes, that represent possible solutions following King. The black ones outlined by the red line are the actual observed planes from one, and this is an application for one event. So as you see here, they are far off from what we actually observed. And this is one main problem with using Coulomb stress change theory. So if we repeat this type of test for the whole sequence, we see that um, here in right, we have a difference of rakes uh, around 90, degrees between observed and theoretical solutions. And we have um, a Euclidean distance 
um, with an, an, an average discrepancy of 115. So what we can do more to go from this deterministic almost space with only few solutions that are acceptable into a space that can actually combine a more probabilistic framework of expressing possible hazardous faults. So what we have done is that we have um, taken instead of the stress change, the total stress tensor, which is the pre-existing secular stress field, um, uh, which can be spatially varying, and the cosizing stress changes. And we have expressed this uh, total sum in thousands of faults and with all possible strike dips and rakes. So now, instead of six points, as I showed in the figure before, we have almost one million estimations of stress values per grid point. And this, uh, so with this method, we can always find a claim that fits the observed focal mechanism. And indeed, as you will see here, in the percentage of um, uh, possible planes that can rupture uh, in one grid point uh, in Southern California, where the largest aftershock occurred, uh, we don't only have the ideal strike slip faults, but we have a percentage of normal faults and also thrust faults that can actually slip during the aftershock sequence. However, you're going to ask me, but how efficient it is if you have one million stress values and you have no descriptor of which of these values are actually used. So this was the problem that we tried to go deeper. So what we have done to answer this question is we have taken, nearest, we have taken the nearest focal mechanism from the um, 30 years of seismicity in Southern California. And we have um, assumed that an accurate descriptor of future aftershocks is one um, even small magnitude earthquake that happened nearby. So we have taken all past earthquakes with magnitude three and above, the 30 years before El Mayor. So if you do this and use as a primary tank of hazardous faults, the 1 million faults, plus this knowledge of past events, you are getting the answer right to which fault in a specific location is likely to rupture at 89%. So, and this is a huge um, uh, improvement in our understanding on how to represent hazardous faults in a probabilistic way. And it is a useful also framework for asking all sorts of questions. For example, one other question that uh, we could answer following this approach is whether even when we combine the pre-existing and the co-seismic stress changes to, um, for, for accurate stress estimates at the point, uh, do maximum theoretical planes uh, express the plane that ruptured during aftershock sequence? We found that actually only 18% of aftershocks can be explained by this um, modeling. So one other thing that uh, we found uh, during this experiment is that it's not necessary that aftershocks occur in the theoretical maximum plane, because it seems that we were right many years before as a community that uh, the faults are always in a critical state. So even a tiny drop of extra stress following, enough, following a main shock can actually make the difference. Now, I am going to move uh, forward to something different, but also in a way very complementary, uh, because in order for physics-based forecast to improve in the next few years, definitely we have to include more physics to them. So there are some things that I spoke until now about shallow crust and things we don't really understand there. Uh, but there are other things and other phenomena such as slow slip events that we do not readily um, incorporate in our forecast models. And this was, quite, this was made quite clear in an analysis of um, the triggering of the 2018 7.1 Anchorage earthquake in Alaska, USA. So you see here the epicenter of the 7.1. Uh, 
Here in gray, you see the epicenter of the largest recorded uh, in modern history earthquake, the 9.2 Great Alaska earthquake from 1964. And the colorful um, points represent different depths of uh, seismicity for the intermediate time period. Uh, here, these boxes represent uh, the occurrences, the locations where slow slip events have been observed just below the Anchorage 7.1 uh, 2018 earthquake. So we had um, a first um, slow slip event uh, here uh, with a blue outline and the second slow slip event here in red. The first slow slip event occurred for almost 12 years starting from around 1992 until 2004 and the, the equivalent moment reached a 7.8 uh, whereas the second as was more limited in duration around three years between 2009 and 2011. So what we have done is that we have taken all the uh, published uh, geometry for the Anchorage plain, uh, published in the first day from USGS, and the published in GRL model uh, uh, in 2019, uh, which is the, uh, the, the panel below. And we have used as, um, as events that induce stress on this Anchorage plain, the 1964 uh, co-seismic uh, model, the co-seismic model of 64, the first slow slip event, and the second slow slip event. So what I'm showing in the diagrams is a time series of stress changes. So what this shows is that the fault plane of Anchorage 2018 had actually multiple influences. Influences that come very important from post-seismic effects of 1964, but also from the long duration slow slip event with cumulative moment again 7.8. However... You, if you could try and wrap up in the next minute or two, please. Yes, yes, I'm wrapping up here. Uh, we also tried um, to see if these events had a signature that were important for the seismicity of Alaska. And we saw that during the, we modeled using statistical framework known as ETAS. Um, and here you see in gray the observed number of events just above the slow slip events. So we are on the 20 to 40 kilometers depth. And you see, as the slow slip event was expanding its duration, the seismicity above had an ascending and a descending track. So, which means that there are other things that happen, such as slow slip, their interactions, that they are induced by after sleep or post seismic events, and all of them have their uh, significance. Um, and they have to be readily incorporated in order for for us to see a more successful physics based forecasting in the next few years. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. So we've got time for one quick question and Tim has already got in there with one. So Tim says, thanks for the presentation. Can your new Coulomb stress method explain the relative absence of earthquakes in some locations? Or will there always be a possible failure plane in any location? Will it enable better predictions than statistical models like ETAS? Okay, so the first question is yes. So the model can always find uh, a, a plane that can be positive. So there, it can explain the absence of shadows. Uh, actually, there are no shadows. There are shadows that we are seeing when we focus only in major faults. But they're not, they're not only major faults, there are other faults that are minor. And they are the ones that um, we thought uh, created the shadow before. Uh, will it enable better predictions and statistical models? So it creates different predictions. Um, it is in a way closer to ETAS uh, because it slowly becomes as ETAS an all positive forecast. So, which means that now the performance is expected to be better. 
that. Thank you very much. Not a very quick question. I think I, I, I tried to merge everything. Yeah. So uh, the final talk in this session then, uh, this is a half hour one. And it's going to be given jointly by Milan and Yasser from Leeds, who are going to give us an update on the Lixar system. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is my pleasure to be here as my first uh, Comet annual meeting. So uh, in this uh, presentation, me and Milan are going to uh, talk about the recent developments that we have had in the Lixar system. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all the technical details here. Uh, you, as you all may know that the Lixar system is uh, based on the Jasmine computational infrastructure uh, provided by the CEDA in Farvel. And Jasmine is a supercomputer designed for the uh, environmental data analysis supercomputation. And it has over 50 petabytes of storage and uh, more than 10,000 cores distributed between a batch cluster and a community cloud. And the Lixar system automatically generates the INSAR products for each frame. I will show you in the next slide what these products are. And uh, so the main focus is to monitor the global tectonics to detect the volcanic deformation and to generate the earthquake response in TEF programs. Um, here you can see the, the Lixar system file structure, uh, which shows all the products that we are generating in the Lixar. I think from the top level, uh, you can see that we have 175 different different folders, uh, which refers to different Sentinel-1 orbits. And in each orbit, in each folder here, we have different frames. And for uh, each frame, we store the in-star products within the interprogram folder, as you can see here. So uh, these are the main in-star products that we are storing in the public storage. And uh, just uh, if I want to list them, so we have the coherence image here. We have the filtered wrapped phase and the corresponding unwrapped phase. Also recently, they started to store the filter unfiltered wrapped phases in the public storage. And this is now available for all the frames. And uh, so beside this uh, uh, in-star products, we also have some uh, useful information in the meta folder, as you can see here. And uh, so these meta folder includes the E and U geotiff file, which refers to the east, north, and upward components of the line of sight unit vector for each pixel. And this uh, information uh, would be very useful to project the E and U modeling deformation results or the 3D geodetic GNSS uh, data into the line of sight vector based on the uh, concept that you can see here. So they can easily be combined together. This is, the, for example, a model deformation in, in east, north, and up. And uh, using this unit vector information, and based on this uh, equation, we can obtain this information, this uh, deformation as a model deformation in the line of sight. Uh, so um, obtaining the, um, the INSAR products for the whole Alpine Himalayan belt has been one of the main objectives of the Lixar team. So in order to orchestrate this, we uh, divided the whole Alpine Himalayan belt into three different priority zones. Uh, you can see all different zones in this map. Zone one includes in the, the, third and, uh, the North Anatolian fault in Turkey, the whole Turkey actually, the Zagros fault in the west of Iran, the east of Tibet, and the East African rift. And this zone, which is shown by the yellow polygons here, includes 270 frames. Uh, we have also zone two, uh, which covers east of Iran and also the Caucasus and west, west of Tibet, Tibet. And in this zone, we have about 260 frames. And uh, so the zone three actually uh, covers the rest of the prior, the rest of the uh, zone in the Alpine Himalayan belt. So altogether, for the old Alpine Himalayan belt, we have about 610 frames in the Lixar system. 
So here I would like to give some uh, explanation over the current status of the system by some uh, statistics and figures, as you can see. As of June 2020, we have a total of uh, 1,507 frames in the Lixar system, uh, in which we processed more than 88,000 uh, Sentinel-1 acquisitions and generated more than 280,000 interprograms within these frames. Among these frames, about 470 frames are the volcanic frames, which covers about uh, 1,024 global volcanoes. Uh, here are some um, uh, updating policy that we have in the Lixar. Uh, the first one is the monthly update. We have a list of about 535 frames, mainly the tectonic frames, basically, uh, which are updated uh, on a monthly basis. So these are actually completed frames in terms of the processing. We, are just want, uh, we just want to keep them live by this monthly processing. Also, we have a weekly update, uh, which, uh, in which we are currently have about 100 frames. And this is mainly volcanic frames, which are being updated on a weekly basis. Also, we have another list uh, in which we call it active volcanoes update. And uh, so this is a variable list and uh, the, 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 the frames are coming from uh, this database, this uh, global volcanism uh, program database. So it can, uh, it, it, it depends on the uh, volcanic activities. And uh, this uh, uh, list, actually this list is being updated three times per week and uh, the processing are performed as early as a Sentinel-1 uh, acquisition. So if I want to give you a, a general view of the current status of different priority zones, in pri priority zone one, uh, more than 72% of the, this priority zone has already been finished. We only have some gap filling tasks in this priority zone, which uh, we are currently doing. And maybe in the next two or three weeks, we can finish this priority zone. We have priority, priority zone number two, in which we have done more than 66% of the processing so far. And also for the whole Alpine Himalayan belt, uh, we finished 57% of the processing so far. And maybe in the next uh, couple of months, uh, the whole belt could be processed in terms of the INSAR products. This figure shows the, uh, the number of interprograms which are generated as early as 2016, uh, when the Lixar system has emerged up until the present. And you can see we had a, we had a significant increase in the, in the past year. And in June uh, 2019, the past actually Comet meeting, the number of interprograms was uh, 114,000 interprograms. Whereas currently in June 2020, we have processed more than 280,000 interprograms. And here you can visually see the the, the different frames, the status in terms of the processing from the old Alpine to Himalaya. And you can see the black areas are already completed in terms of the processing and they are kind of live frames. And uh, so it, as it is clear, maybe we can complete the whole region in the next couple of months to have all the INSAR products available for this whole region. So here I would like to uh, introduce two recent modules that we developed in the Lixar system. The first module is the Lixar GACOS module. Um, it has been already investigated in many studies that uh, the GACOS correction can improve the, the time series results. And in some studies, it has been shown that uh, the standard deviation of the interprograms can be removed, can be reduced actually by 20 to 30 percent after doing the GACOS correction. This is an example in uh, Turkey in which the, uh, Jonathan and his colleagues did for the North Anatolian fault. And uh, you can see there that after GACOS correction, uh, we have some improvements in the obtained velocity. So uh, in order to facilitate this for the leaks, uh, we recently developed uh, some tools for including the GACOS products into the Lixar database. Uh, this was performed through the Comet GACOS API uh, from the Newcastle University, thanks to 
Chen Yu and uh, his colleague in Newcastle. So uh, gag cost corrections are computed uh, for each Lixar frame, and they are the same size, the same image size as the Lixar product. So I can say that the added value of the, uh, the gag cost products that we are producing in Lixar are these two items. The first is that they are the same resolution as the Lixar products that we are uh, generating, and also they are provided at both vertical and line of sight direction. And uh, here we, uh, you can see in this uh, file structure, this is where we are storing the, the GACOS products in the, in the system. As I said, uh, we are storing the, the GACOS products in both the Zenit angle, which is coming from, which comes from the, directly from the uh, Newcastle uh, web server. And also another one is the uh, one which is given, which is uh, projected into the slant range correction. And uh, so the good, news is, the good news is that the Comet users can also use the, uh, this uh, script for producing the GACOS corrections, as you can see here. So this is, we are uh, currently on the testing period. So uh, we have already generated the GACOS products for more than 50% of the priority zone number one. So if there are maybe some regions that the, the users are going to uh, study, they can uh, generate the GACOS products based on this. Uh, a script. Another uh, good news is that the LixPass can now automatically read the Lixar GACOS correction if the user selects the option and for developing this. Um, the next module that I would like to introduce uh, here is the Lixar quality check uh, module. Uh, well, the Lixar system is kind of automatic system. So uh, it is very likely that some of the entire programs that are generated are uh, bad entire programs. You can see some of the examples of these bad entire programs in this slide. So it is very important to identify these uh, bad entire programs and try to uh, reprocess them or uh, correct them before archiving. We recently have developed a two-step approach for doing this quality check in the Lixar system. Uh, the first step, uh, as you can see in this fellow chart, is based on a, a morphological image processing technique. And uh, so it uh, uses the, let's say, the edge enhancement techniques and also the line detections to uh, identify those artifacts in the, in the interprogram and then assign it as a bad interprogram. So we test it over many different frames and uh, it was very successful in terms of identifying the bad interprogram and we can uh, remove these bad interprograms and then try to reprocess them afterward. The, uh, the second step in the Lixar quality check is um, based on the, mean co the normalized mean coherence and also the normalized, uh, let's say, unwrapped fraction uh, to form a two-dimensional feature space based on these two features. And in this uh, two-dimensional feature, uh, we can see that the, we can identify the program by defining some thresholds in this space. And this, uh, this, this step was developed by Fabian Albino from Bristol University. And uh, we tested also this one and uh, tried to tune uh, the, the, the best threshold for this algorithm using different frames and different training samples that we have had. And uh, the comment users that can now use this script for uh, doing the quality check, we are testing this at, at the moment actually for different frames, but it has been working quite good. So maybe in the near future, all the comment users will be able to use this script for uh, identification of the bad inter programs uh, within their frame, frame of a study. And finally, in my presentation, I would like to show some uh, initial time series analysis based on the Lixar products for different frames. And uh, here we only focused uh, on those frames for which we have at least uh, a one year of connected time series network. And, uh, as you know, the availability of a long-term connected network is very important in the time series analysis. So we have a check gap a script just in the middle to, uh, to figure out the gaps and try to uh, fill these gaps before going to the, uh, to the time series analysis. And uh, once these gaps are filled, the time series analysis based on the LexPass 
is uh, performed. I just want to show some preliminary results on this. This is the, uh, the velocity map for the uh, descending and also this one for ascending for those frames that uh, uh, like actually meet those criteria that I just mentioned in the uh, previous slide. And it should be noted that this is just based on the uh, frame-wise analysis. So uh, we have not done any kind of uh, uh, frame merging algorithm to merge these frames. So it is only based on the frames. And this is currently, we are currently working on this step. And uh, in my last slide is, uh, I will show you some ongoing tasks that we are uh, working on. This is very important to go from the time series of the frames to large scale velocity fields uh, by first generating the regional velocity field by tying the velocities to GNSS and linking all the frames together based on different algorithms that we are currently investigating. And uh, also second, uh, we are trying to generate a strain rate maps based on the previous uh, velocity field that uh, uh, will be obtained actually. Uh, from the first step. So these are the things that we are uh, trying to finish in the maybe uh, by the next uh, Comet meeting. And uh, yeah, that is it from my side. And I think Milan is going to uh, continue uh, with some other updates from his side. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, Yasser. So Milan, if you just Start sharing whenever you're ready and we can carry on and then take questions at the end. Okay, I'll try it. Um, yeah. Is it, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Let's try it again. Is it visible? Yes, okay, I can see that fine, thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll be relatively short, I guess. So, um, so, uh, Lixar, I would like to uh, show a little bit from my perspective um, as a currently um, like core programmer of the, of the Lixar system, like, um, as you could, uh, as you could have seen by, uh, from Yasir, we have some interesting task to um, to see the surface deformations over the whole Alpine Himalayan belt, and uh, of course, this is uh, quite a task. And of course, um, it was uh, the, the, we just like um, evolve on what is been created uh, since 2015. Actually, we can say that the real co core part of uh, Lixar is uh, the, um, the specific solution on uh, burst identification from, of, of, the, of the Sentinel-1 um, images. So like um, we, have, um, we have an identifier of, of, of um, each part of the, um, of, of the image acquired i will show um like each uh, sentinel one data is uh, consisting of uh, consists of um, these uh, small units called called bursts let's say 80 times 20 kilometers and uh, these are actually being merged into a unit called frame and there are some specific ways of processing. So in the end, we have we are processing uh, data of let's say 260 times 260 kilometers with a resolution of uh, let's say 50 times 50 meters because we are doing some multi looking. Um, yeah, and we are dealing with a lot of technical problems within. So um, just very briefly, how how does it work when? when there is a new acquisition from the Sentinel-1 satellite, it, um, the data goes to the Copernicus Sci-Hub system, where you can, from where you can download it, and to some other mirrors like uh, Alaska ASF and uh, CIDA Archive. There is a UK mirror of some over two petabytes of the Copernicus data. 
And uh, these three sources are used within, within Lixar system. Um, so the core is a database that is actually like interconnecting the files that you can download, the bursts that are identified and the frames that we are like, uh, uh, that are these, uh, these interconnected bursts. And uh, so this is a geo database that we can quite play well with. And uh, then we have some Lixar processing chain that is working on the under SIDA uh, computing facility. Um, we have custom queues so we can run like 120 parallel jobs. Um, speaking about this, like um, a full resample of one um, frame image would take some one and a half hours in, uh, in one job. So like within, let's say two hours, we can have 120 images processed, let's say. So like things are, Mm, optimized into frame processing libraries and they involve uh, uh, generation of interferograms and wrapping the frame quality checking and potentially also the the GACOS correction and so on which we which we are like um, um, generating and and sharing so we generate actually four combinations per each image yeah, and uh, do some basic uh, filtering. Uh, our parameters are adaptable per frame, so but we currently don't adapt much. Uh, it's all in some standard way, which is uh, probably fine for tectonics, but uh, sometimes uh, you can lose some signal from landslides and so on. So this is to bear in mind. And finally, um, we share in it in in our in our system and um, interconnect our tools with the uh, um, with the SIDA archive and EPOS and other global metadata system and um, also there are tools like Lixbus that are directly downloading the data and processing them. So well, what is Lixbus? It's actually a um, very nice open source NSBus Python implementation that um, got born. Uh, in Leeds last year um, by Yumor Shita, the main programmer of, of this tool. And it's generally NSPass. Um, so, like, let's say, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a it's an open source tool. You can you can download it and um, and uh, do some processing. Here is some example of uh, of automatic processing using the Lixar data and like uh, standard parameters and uh, what you can see and what you can, could have seen during the poster session by Daniel Yunsu. Um, uh, this is the this is um, Grindavik in Iceland and. You can see that since 2020, there is clearly uh, some some uplift is uh, clearly visible from from this automatic processing. Now, um, going a step a little further with uh, the Lixar system, um, we have um, we started to use a separate HPC server in Leeds and um, do something called earthquake inside data provider like a system that responds to earthquake events and um, what currently uh, well it's it, it's new but it works um, currently we should have um, co-seismic interferograms in less than three hours after um, these post earthquake images appear on copernicus sci-hub um, yeah, um, the coseismic interferograms are again shared within um, within global databases. Here is um, an example of um, our only one interferogram on GTAP currently, but I think quite a significant one. This is uh, um, this is interferogram of length of over one thousand five hundred kilometers and. Uh, 
you if you could try it. and wrap it up in a minute or two, please. Yeah, 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 definitely. I have just just some pictures of the earthquakes. Uh, yeah. So, um, it, yeah. Generally, like we are, um, we are, um, we are connecting to USGS um, server to get information of the current events, and uh, use SciHub to to download uh, to download images as fast as possible, and uh, related to the magnitude and the depth of the of the hypocenter of the earthquake, even we are. Uh, getting appropriate like radius and time uh, to observe po to to process the post seismic interferograms and we generate KML files which you can download and these are some latest automatic um, responses. Uh, this is a Turkish earthquake. Uh, when was it? A couple of days ago. Um, here is uh, Iran. Also, not long time ago. A week ago, and this is uh, this is in Russia. Um, yeah, all automatic processing. And uh, what is currently um, in preparation is a web map. And I would like to um, invite you to Friday's talk of uh, Scott Watson that should show some progress about the Comet web map. We are all looking forward for that. Well, thank you. Hope I didn't bore you too much. Excellent. Thank you both for a pair of really interesting talks. So does anyone have any questions? Put them in the group chat if you do. So I'll kick off with, oh, actually no Pablo's going before me. Excellent. So can you share which information determined the empirical rules, for example, post-seismic observation period? Um, I think the best person to answer this would be uh, John Elliott. Not sure if he's here, but anyway, um, uh, it's by by his empirical uh, knowledge, um, simply based on the on the magnitude, mainly of the earthquake. We are um, we are uh, processing either uh, like one month um, after our uh, or. or half year after the earthquake we are generating processing interferogram. Excellent. And we have a question from Valerie who asks, is the data archiving interoperable with the EPOS data? I will answer that. Um, EPOS is still an ongoing work and we are just uh, waiting um, until the developers will finish with the Met metadata injection system scripts and like it should be last year maybe two years ago so i i hope that this this year it will be there yeah excellent well thank you both very much for that and we now got a tea and coffee break